Next up is uh, Mark uh, and Zuko, uh, who are going to be talking about opportunities and challenges from Web 2 to Web 3, which is a, a wonderful way to go. OK, Thanks. great. Hi, Zuko. Hi there. Thanks for having Hi. me on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad to uh, we could do this together. Um, Likewise. So yeah, Zuko and I have a long history uh, together um, as cypherpunks, as people pursuing uh, these ideas, the ideas that um, are currently uh, labeled Web3. In terms of, of what we mean by Web3, uh, both Zuko and I very, very much like the framing uh, from Jay Graber. Yeah. Um, uh, which I know Zuko, I just saw a tweet from Zuko that he just now looked at in preparation for this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Zuko, would you like to uh, talk about uh, Jay's framing about yeah. uh, what Web3 is and how it relates to what we've been doing? Yeah, and and Jay, if you don't know, is is the, the leader of a, a little spin-off of Twitter called Project Blue Sky, which is trying to make decentralized Web3 successor to Twitter. Um, but yeah, she she posted a blog post recently about Web3. And she set out to write the whole thing, explaining it to people without using the word decentralized and without using the word distributed, which I thought was a great way to do it. And what she came up with was that Web1 was the hosted web where you had to run your web server if you wanted to share anything with anyone on that version of the World Wide Web. And then and Web2 is what she called the posted web where the people who this, the companies that ran web servers started hosting content generated by their users. So uh, in, in web one, it was user generated content and user hosted content. And in web two, it was user generated content, but but company hosted content. And so Jay's interpretation of web three is that it's user generated content and the users also control the content. If that makes sense. Not sure I quite got it right. But when I was thinking about it this morning, it made me think that we've already seen. So the, the Web3 technology is in this stage where it's mostly of use to programmers. Um, and it's just barely reaching the stage where it's of use to non-programmer users. And I was realizing that probably most of the value add for the programmers who are already using Web3 is just you don't have to host your code anymore, right? Instead of maintaining an AWS instance and keeping it upgraded and so forth, you can you can publish your code and then it, it it's automatically deployed and main and and like kept live by some blockchain like Ethereum. What do you think? Is that is that sort of the main advantage of Web three so far for coders? Yeah, I think that that. Um... I think that creates a lot of uh, good for, good context there. Uh, I would uh, emphasize, though, that um, what we're about is really beyond the word content is a little bit mm. uh, truncated in terms of what it suggests. Mm. What we're really about is interact is is creating arrangements for interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. with, uh, and for example, the smart contracting is all about uh, creating arrangements for cooperation with with limited vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And the transition from Web 2 to Web 3 in that context is removing third party vulnerability, becoming much less vulnerable to third parties so that the residual vulnerability is much more to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the the contract structures those relationships to reduce those vulnerabilities. And, and the main third parties in question in the Web two era are the platforms, right? Yes. Yes. So um, so that's that's really related to what I was saying. The 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 sort of user experience for a coder, in my opinion, of using Web three instead of of Web two, is like deployment. Is easier once you deploy it stays deployed without maintenance effort on your part and to what you're saying the difference is that in web 2 when you get that positive user experience the way you get it is by relying on it becoming vulnerable to some platform yeah uh, and in web 3 you get that same user experience of it stays deployed and you don't have to keep propping it up 
uh, but without vulnerability on some platform. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that lack of vulnerability is the source of the credibility, the source of the, the ability for us to understand that our risk in contract contracting is to each other and to our understanding of the contract that we've removed this additional risk to corruption of the platform. Uh, mm. And it's not and it's not just the, the risk of corruption to the platform is not just whether the platform provider uh, themselves uh, has ill intention. It's also whether the platform provider uh, uh, is in a jurisdiction where the um, uh, that enables them to be strong armed into operating in a corrupt manner. Right. Legal legal pressure or social pressure, or they could just screw up and misclassify your stuff or accidentally lose your stuff. So all of that put together is what people call platform risk, right? Yes. Yes. And I, and I think that um, in a lot of ways, you know, you and I have been working on Web3 by this by these definitions um, in some ways since before Web1. Oh, yeah. that uh, that the the point of a lot of these cryptographic protocols uh, is that the cryptographic protocol itself removes the risk to third party platforms. It's it's just um, my my system that that for what for some reason I trust and you don't, and your system that you trust and I don't that. We can now interact through a cryptographic protocol that protects each of us from each other's misbehavior. Yeah, end-to-end uh, -end encryption is a is a is a long-standing example of that. Yeah, and um, then the interesting thing in that regard is that our vision of the our Web three oriented vision, our vision of smart contracting, our vision of anonymous transactions. Uh, back then, most of that evolved before the invention of blockchain. Uh -huh. And it's interesting to to come back to that and think, well, what is it that blockchain really contributes? Why is why is the current blockchain based world of smart contracting? Uh, in what way does that really take the whole Web3 vision up a notch? And I think, yeah, I think that uh, the the clear answer to that is that before blockchain, we knew that that any one node in the network of interaction might go bad, and the resilience just came from competition and reputation feedback. Any any one uh, system might go bad. Any one mutually trusted uh, contract host for running a contract uh, yeah. might get corrupted, but these were all in competition with each other, and you could switch to one that had a better reputation. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, uh, a just kind of discouraging lesson to me from the whole evolution of web two is that the benefits of competition are muted by the um, the network effect of the biggest platform getting bigger and bigger until your alternative to that platform is is is, is so unappealing that you have to you, you don't have to but you um, you basically end up relying on that biggest platform or the, or the one where, you know, all of the people that you want to interact with are already there, even if it's uh, uh, extracting rent from you or unreliable for you in certain ways, because uh, just open competition doesn't provide most people with appealing alternatives. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think that's one of the things that I certainly underestimated. Yeah, me too. Uh, and um, is I, I expected that just competition and reputation feedback would result in a more decentralized network of competitors and more consumer choice. Yeah. And the what we've seen is that that um, uh, the convenience offered by these uh, internet giants uh, have made people willing at first to centralize their vulnerabilities with them. Yeah. Uh, but then once those vulnerabilities are centralized, then they become irresistible targets for corruption. Uh, 
So there's convenience, at least for starters, but then in the long run, there's a, a network effect. So philosophically, I've been been trying to broaden my mind from from thinking, well, so what I think is important, like the, the, the basic touchstone of my philosophy is the concept of consent, right? I like to yeah. divide. It's a very simple. You get a lot of intellectual leverage out of dividing everything in the world into consensual and non-consensual and then treating the two things differently. Um, but because of my observations about the evolution of our whole society and our whole industry in light of Web 2 and the tech giants and so forth, I, I've been trying to make that more nuanced by thinking consent there's a bit of there's a there's a gray area which is what's your alternative right so people who users i'm thinking of rather than coders uh, but the same applies to coders who are looking for a platform to deploy their own product on top of they they have the option to use uh the biggest platform with the most users and the most strong network effect and the question is, what's their alternative if they're dissatisfied with something about that? Um, and to the greater degree that you have viable alternatives, then it, it's fair in my simple intellectual model to say that you're consenting to whatever the, the, the offer is that that platform gives you. But to the greater degree that you don't have a second best alternative, it's just not viable. You couldn't survive on the... Uh, you know, if, if you for if you chose to uh, you know leave uh, the dominant platform and go to the uh, to the minority platform, and that you just that wouldn't be a viable business or a viable life for you, then the 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 terms that the big platform is offering you are less something that you're consenting to and more something that you are obligated to accept. Yeah, and and what um, blockchain uh, brings to the, brings to uh, this Web three world is it can create a single virtual platform that's built out of massive multi way agreement and cross checking yeah. of many actual parties, and therefore represents something that it, that has some of the benefits of centralization, some of the benefits of mm -hmm. being a single rendezvous point that can right. have the network effects, yeah, network while, effects. while still having the decentralized advantages of not being corruptible, of, of right. no one really being in a position to corrupt it, not even large national governments that are that, that, yeah. uh, spending lots of resources. <laughs> and not even the creators of that initial platform. There's this lovely aspect of blockchain as a platform that <clears throat> once you decide to move there and spend your, your effort uh, setting up there, it's difficult or impossible for anyone, including the original creators, to change the terms, right? Well, you log on, you get a new terms of service and it says, okay, now we're gonna start scraping your data and selling it to advertisers or whatever. Uh, that happens in, all the time on a centralized platform, but it's difficult or impossible for a blockchain to do that to you, to change yes. the rules. Yeah. Yeah. And the, to the degree that blockchains arrange to be able to change the rules, they do it with a, by setting up ahead of time, a transparent governance arrangement mm -hmm. uh, for bringing about those rule changes. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that that uh, in the context of uh, Zcash, you've been very involved in um, uh, in in the dynamics of that and how that's oh, proceeded yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's been very interesting to watch Zcash as a very very high integrity um, uh, example mm -hmm. of how you've rolled out uh, some of those changes under some very difficult conditions. Yeah, and if, for those who don't know, Zcash is a blockchain. It's one of the generation, approximately the same generation as Ethereum. So uh, from the perspective of the Web3 world, it's a, a grizzled veteran. <laughs> it's a, a whole five years old now. It's a toddler. Um, but yeah, Zcash is a blockchain, which like Bitcoin is mostly just about moving money and encrypted messages back and forth. Uh, and the, the, the special thing about Zcash is that it builds in end-to-end -end encryption on top of blockchain. So we get both of those properties. Yeah, one of the things that, that a lot of people don't understand about 
most of the other blockchains is the traceability. It is true that that the people transacting can be anonymous or pseudonymous. They don't reveal their their genuine identity, but they leave behind this enormous trail of traceable transactions. Yeah, and and that uh, the more people take a look at how susceptible that is to being reverse engineered by people doing statistics on that whole transaction history and trying to correlate yeah. it with what happens in the world, the degree to which your privacy is protected through traceable transactions is really quite reduced. Yeah, I've seen this a lot. I, I guess, you know, Bitcoin, the original blockchain is something on the order of 12 years old now. I've been watching it closely the whole time. I remember trying to persuade you, Markham, that it was a, a viable new technology for, for the first few years. Um, I'm the author of the first ever blog post posted to the internet about Bitcoin. Um, what was my point? My point is even now, 12 years in, one of the most common conversations that I overhear or that I have with people is people saying, wait, I thought this new Bitcoin slash blockchain slash Web3 stuff was all inherently anonymous um and other people saying yeah i thought so too like that's that's sort of the level of 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 learning that that the rest of the world is at um is realizing that blockchain while it does a whole lot of great things it does not inherently protect anyone's privacy uh, although zcash does which is why we made zcash it reminds me of the early days of the internet in like the 1990s when people thought well, my IP address is just four numbers with dots between them. It doesn't have <laughs> doesn't have my name in it. It doesn't have my home address in it. So therefore, the internet is like a fully private thing. Um, and it also took a few years for people to learn the better of that. That's a great comparison. I like that. Um, uh, also, people using their cell phone without realizing that uh, that their location is is um, being tracked uh, and leaving leaving this record of a trail of, of physical locations through the world. The, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, the, um, the the zero knowledge uh, proof technology that's behind Zcash that 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 cor that finally corrects the traceability and gives us genuine privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, right now, it's being applied only to uh, transactions to the to the motion of the assets themselves. Right. Um, but uh, but a lot of the uh, zero knowledge research, a lot of the cryptographic research behind that uh, is now looks uh, like it's on the edge of practical for shielding oh, yeah. general purpose computation. And of course, yep. at Agoric, where we're doing a smart contracting platform, uh, we're very much looking forward to eventually integrating with that kind of shielding technology. Uh, uh, you know, right now, the uh, everybody doing smart contracting, including Agoric, has this traceability vulnerability. But right, um, you know, we're architecting it uh, so that we've got a clear division between what's uh, what's being the information that's being revealed in model, being revealed according to our computational um, uh, yeah. model. Uh, versus the information that's simply leaking by virtue of the fact that we're running on top of a traceable medium. Uh, right. So, so yes, yeah. so some things you want to reveal either to some sp specific users or 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 you want to reveal some things to the whole world. So I agree with you. the 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 best approach is to be clear from the beginning about which is which, so that as we improve the technology we can take advantage of that both for privacy and also for performance and scalability right you know there's this there's this deep connection that i learned from from my brother nathan who's the cto of uh is the c he, he's kind of like one of the architects of zcash but he's not the public spokesperson as much as i am but but i learned from him that there's this really interesting sort of information theoretical connection between privacy and scalability privacy is you don't want information to unnecessarily get revealed to someone else. Um, but of course you do still want to reveal information on purpose uh, to other people or even to the whole world. And scalability in computers 
is largely about you don't want un information to get unnecessarily transmitted or computed because that's going to mm -hmm. bog you down. So scalability and privacy may like not for some particular, but also what you say about being principled about separating uh, the intended transmission of each piece of information. Uh, those really go hand in hand. Yeah. So, uh, and one of the um, uh, the the ways that you've explained Zcash that I very much like is it's not just privacy; it's about selective revelation. I'm not quite sure what yeah. what the words were that you used. But selective disclosure. Selective disclosure. Thank you. Where you get to choose uh, in model uh, what's being revealed and still get for what you are for what you are revealing, you get all the benefits. Yeah. Uh, of the mutually trusted platform so that the uh, the people you're revealing it to uh, can see that the information being revealed is authentic. Yeah, you know, there's a, a bigger social discussion that I've been paying a lot of attention to. There's a lot of people, especially from my generation, who say, well, yeah, when I was growing up, I cared about privacy, but kids these days don't because they, they overshare. And I always think that's the wrong meaning of privacy. Privacy isn't about sharing less. Privacy is about sharing with consent, sharing on purpose. <laughs> and I think kids these days are totally into uh, consent and control over what they share with whom. Does that make yeah. sense? So there's this analogy between like social choice of how people use social media and how they how they weave their lives into other people's lives through the internet and this fundamental computer science concept of disclosing some bits of information under some conditions um specifically and intentionally yeah and i think i mean you and i have been um very strong practitioners of open source and open development for a very very long time yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, we're very used to the idea that for much of what of, of our engagement is in the world, we're doing it in public with no shielding. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's our choice which things we do in that mode and which things we do uh, with full privacy. And for the things for which we want it to be private, uh, you know, uh, you've done this. Um, you know, you've spearheaded this incredible innovation to give us much better privacy for those things uh, while building in the selective disclosure with 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 oh. high authenticity. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Transparency is really valuable. There's um, there's an aspect of Zcash which is uh, sort of nuanced. Everyone learns. Well, you know, most people start by thinking that Bitcoin is private. And then if they get past that, they start thinking, oh, OK, so Bitcoin leaks a bunch of information about you whenever you use it. But Zcash is private. Um, and then if they get to the next level, they realize, you know, Zcash is really great for both transparency and privacy. And those are both useful for different purposes. And it's up to you, not up to someone else. Yeah. So so bring this to um, uh, the object capability view that Agoric builds on and how uh, and what I mean by the the in model uh, mm -hmm. versus out of model uh, uh, revealing of information uh, in pure object capability model, the uh, the invocation, the the use of a re of an object reference, the mm -hmm. um, to invoke an object is the only causal pathway. It's the only way by which one object gets to affect the world outside of itself is by. Mm -hmm. Uh, communicating to some object it has a reference to. So mm -hmm. ideally, uh, only the information only makes it from the transmitting object to the receiving object, and there's no other information being leaked. But when you right. run this on top of uh, tr the current transparent blockchains, as we're doing, uh, then uh, everything that happens on the blockchain is also publicly visible. So Right, right. So we're adopting... let me let me just interrupt to, to point out that that's really beautiful about the object capability model. There's this amazing sort of rhyme or analogy or connection between this computer science concept of, of which you are the the, the prime um, advocate and systematizer of the object capability model, 
there's this and the, there's this amazing connection between the object capability model and these bigger social questions about consent and who controls what and who decides for you. And that 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 fascinating weird connection is that in the object capability model, the information gets and the causal effect of 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 your code gets uh transmitted only by the coder's intent it, there's this this very explicit moment when the coder either does or doesn't pass the reference as an argument to the function and that's their expression of intent that they want that information to get shared there and if they do not express that then by default in the object capability model that information will be private or unavailable to the other side right that's right. That's right. We're starting with a baseline of, um, of no implicit authority, no implicit communication, yeah. uh, so that, that all interaction has to be by consent. But then we take all of that and currently run it on top of a transparent blockchain. Right. So in order to prepare for this future transition, uh, the design rule we're adopting is that for all code running on the blockchain, uh, we can neither assume that it. We can neither assume that the platform uh, is opaque, nor assume that the platform is transparent. Mm. Uh, in other words, right now we have to acknowledge the fact that the that the underlying platform is leaking uh, full transparency about what's happening, but right. we can't make use of that transparency. <laughs> in order to purposely communicate information. Anytime we're tempted to do so, we need to bring it in model so that the, the expression of the purposeful communication is handled by sending messages on capabilities, on object references, so that we're all prepared at a later time to run on shielded computation right. where all of our purposeful disclosure to the world remains intact because it was all expressed in model. Exactly. And it's a win-win, not a win-lose. This isn't doing extra work and complicating your code in order to have future compatibility. This actually makes your code more explicit and easier for you, for future you and other people to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the result of doing this for general purpose computation and doing it for contractual relationships is suddenly we have the right of contract back. Suddenly we can create complex cooperative arrangements with each other that are, are as uncensorable as our ability to communicate with each other. Mm, that's powerful. And I think that's, um, you know that that was the dream from the beginning is to yeah um, uh, much of the world I, I like to always bring this back to rule of law um, world uh, is in societies in which uh, there's really no significant rule of law system they're operating under they have no mm. um, uh, functioning legal system they have no um, independent judiciaries etc Right. Um, and their abilities to just uh, lead good lives by um, by cooperating with each other are 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 subject to all sorts of coercive interference by others. Right. And that. Uh, Can I interrupt real quick? Yeah. I had the, the privilege of seeing Gary Kasparov speak last night. The, the, the chess grand from my childhood, and now the the dissident speaking out against the Russian uh, dictator. And he joked that they used to say, in America, the rules, you know what they're going to be, but the outcome, you don't. And in Russia, it's exactly the other way around. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so you were saying about rule of law, there's the, people are very much more empowered to cooperate to one another's benefit and take care of one another when they know what the rules are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that we can, we're, we're creating this kind of predictable rule-based medium for, for 
voluntary consent-based interaction in a jurisdictional free manner. Uh, as, as our conversation right now is a good example of, we're now, most of our interactions with each other these days are not jurisdiction-based. I don't know where you're located in the world right now, and I don't need to care. Yep. Uh, but all of that conventional uh, systems of rule of law are all based in jurisdictional governments, which no longer even fit the nature of the interactions we're having with each other. Yep. So giving people this other medium for bringing about the kinds of predictable cooperative interaction that they're normally, they would normally turn to unreliable jurisdictional systems for uh, is really a great liberating uh, power we're bringing to the world. 